boldly engaging the mindless propaganda of our time, apparently with reason. This is Rage of the Age. This is Rage of the Age, and we have with us today the founder and financial services executive of Theatine Partners. He's also the contributor to sources such as the Wall Street Journal, The Hill, The American Spectator, and Pensions and Investments. I want to introduce to you today Richard Day Schinder. Richard, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you're with me uh, today because mainly I wanted to speak with you primarily about an article you wrote called The Passivity of the Intellectual Right or The Dangerous Passivity of the Intellectual Right. So uh, an overview of what you wrote there, what mainly was you trying to say regarding that? I, I think the main point I was trying to make um, is that I, I feel like much of the thought leadership on the on the political right in, in this country is is too willing to concede um, pretty significant cultural territory to the other side, and and really, are, more specifically, that that our politicians and and again thought leadership on the right. Um, are unwilling to go into communities um, that they perceive to be unfriendly to conservative thought and and really make the case in in a passionate and uh, logically consistent way because and I say this and I, I think my my uh, partisan bona fides are probably well acknowledged and that why you're having me here but there's a great case to be made and it's a case that I, I feel we're not making and and I say we, Purposefully, because I think it's a responsibility for all of us who are who are in the intellectual fray, uh, debating ideas and and you know making our voices heard, to get out and not just preach to the converted, but you know preach to those who who frankly need need to hear the word. That's an interesting way you put it uh, to preach to the converted. Of course, we've probably heard the expression preaching to the choir. It's like um, you don't need to. <laughs> overemphasize to that group because you already have them. There's a, <laughs> there's a whole nother demographic, if you will, who believe contrary to you that you have no influence in. Um, and I think you bring up a very good point because from what I can tell, the, the left is pretty animated to go after people who don't think like them and drag them in. Whereas we seem to have, like you said, a passivity in doing so. It, do you think that's something that's a part of just our mindset or we just ain't got it yet? What do you think the cause of this is? You know, I'm not I'm not really sure. And that, that was one of the reasons I wrote the article, because I, I put forward one supposition in the piece that that perhaps part of it comes from. Um, and I, I, I'd like not to not use the word arrogance, but mm -hmm. but let's say confidence that, well, our ideas are better. The proof is in the pudding. Look at the success of the United States and other Western democracies on, on economic measures and, and cultural measures and freedom, um, quality of life, however, however you'd like to gauge it, and, and let the facts speak for themselves, that, that our, our economic system, our, our um, form of government, is so obviously superior and we've won the day having beaten back fascism and communism and, and collectivism in all its forms. And prior to that, feudalism and monarchy and all these other competing system, economic systems and forms of government. And therefore, it should be self-evident to people, well, of course, this is the best system. And I think that has, has bred the passivity that I referred to in, in the piece you're referencing. So it's sort of like resting on your laurels uh, that, you know, so used to so many victories, it's almost like by default, we expect to win or something. I, I think that's exactly right. And I, I think it's easy to become complacent. And I think and, and this is probably a bit off topic and, and beyond what I discussed in the in, in the opinion piece. But, um, you know, it's it's, it's very easy to. Um, you know, to get fat and lazy when, when you've experienced success. And, and I, right. I do allied the point a bit in the article around, um, you know, it, particularly in our, in our educational system, you know, really not beating the drum as, as vociferously as we could and defending, you know, what I would describe as classical liberalism. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that has left the field open in, in our educational institutions, in our media, in Hollywood for competing ideas to come in and, as you mentioned, sort of fill that void. Um, and we're not we're not making the case. But and you talk about it also as a war of ideas uh, that we, we need to. Um... We need to start fighting the war of ideas again, is basically how you put it. And, and it, this is a war of ideas, but it's almost like it's a war uh, that many conservatives don't even know are going on or something. Well, and, and I think you've hit a very important point. I, I, again, I think uh, many on, the, on the, the conservative side of the spectrum um, subscribe to the view that, that Francis Fukuyama um, expressed about 30 years ago that we were having defeated the Soviet Union, we were at the end of history, which which mm -hmm. implied or actually didn't imply it was an express point of view that okay, classical liberalism has has won the day, and um, will never presumably never see a competing ideology or or um, um, belief system that will challenge the primacy of of Western liberalism. And that's just a falsehood. And and again, I think we're we're witnessing that today with um, you know a lot of, of of ideas that are gaining purchase in the public square around intersectionality or or critical race theory or um, cultural Marxism and and those those folks are out there making their case. And that that is the beauty of our system is that everyone has a forum in which to make a case. And if we're not making the case we're losing. And that's, and that's what, what concerns me. And again, gave rise to my wanting to, to make that point. Yes. And some points you even talked about, uh, I don't even know if I'm saying this right, but uh, Gaia worship, uh, <laughs> Gayo, I don't know. Uh, Gaio, I've never, I'm not really, I had to look that up. Like what in the world? And it's crazy stuff. I'm like, uh, again, in my head, self-evident that stuff's been, you know, debunked, you know, ages ago, but here it is making a recurrence. <laughs> You know, uh, self-esteem uber ales, a, a good play of words, by the way, you know, uh, associating that with, uh, you know, Deutschland uber ales, I think, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, have allies at all costs, whether you're good allies or not, doesn't matter, support each other. Um, it, it's an organized attempt to just, I don't know, in my mind, it's just to derail what is at, by any cost, by any means, whoever your bedfellow is, doesn't matter as long as we tear down what is. So we can just start something new. To me, that seems to be the whole attitude of the aggressive left as it is now. Well, it's it's interesting because um, there's a there's a um, a cliche that's used in in parts of the Arab world, um, particularly those that are that are liberalizing, um, and it's been used elsewhere. Um, where the, the the statement goes, you know. Um, uh, I'm not getting this quite right, but but effectively in a liberalizing um, um, uh, political environment, you know, one vote, one time, meaning mm -hmm. using um, the tools of a of a free system, uh, you know, a, a democratic system, and one that you know respects the rule of law, and exploiting that system to mm -hmm. pursue other ends. And I think what you're describing is exactly that. It's that um by having the freedoms and 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 um and you know rights as embodied in our bill of rights available to all to all citizens and all comers in our society um there are parties who use those rights or and are using those rights to actively work uh, against the the maintenance of those rights and effectively sort of exploit the weaknesses of a of a liberal polity and a liberal economic system uh, to advance collectivist ends. And that's, you know, again, I, for my part, I wouldn't have it any other way. Freedom is a, is a you know, primary um, objective ab above all, and having a free system is worth the challenges that may arise from, from the illiberal. But again, that's why it is critical that those who are on the side of freedom and liberty actively make the case and not assume that even those who exploit it to their own ends will respect it if, if they were to ever uh, gain political power. Yeah, because I don't think they will respect it. It's a, a means mm -hmm. to an end. And, and, but uh, I don't know if I would call it a, a weakness in the system. It's a weakness if only 
you let them use it and you don't use it. That, that, that's right. It's, it's having a, a castle that's undefended. It's, it's mm -hmm. not the castle's fault uh, that it was left undefended. You know, the castle, you know, has, has ramparts and parapets and all, you know, all the, all the right equipment and, and configuration. But if it's left undefended and abandoned, uh, it's difficult to, to maintain. And I think that's, that's a good analogy for what uh, our system faces today. The onslaught uh, injection, uh, but you change it to assault or something. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I see it as an actual war myself, and and I only and I've only recently have discovered to look at it that way because that's not a conservative mindset. That's a very liberal, well, the modern liberals' mindset. Political activity is war to them, whereas to us it's not. They see it as a war, and as you said. You may, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Yeah, and, and I think there's, and, and this is where, and, and this may ultimately be the, the subject of another piece, but I, mm -hmm. but I often um, reflect on the fact that I think there are many well-meaning people of goodwill you know, who are left of center, who don't fully appreciate the, the passion and, and the objectives of, of their cohorts that are further left of them uh, with respect to just how, how animated they are and how serious they are about yes. implementing the policies that they're describing. And, and what I often think about, and, and, and again, this is a little trite, but it, it's something that, that other conservative commentators will remark upon, is that I, I really do believe that, that most people on the right have other affiliations and other um, priorities that that um, motivate them and animate them beyond politics and policy and 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 the um, gaining of political power. We have our families and our jobs and and our other affiliations and our religion and or, or no religion, but other belief systems that matter to us. And because we are focused on those things, bettering our lives, bettering our family lives, being active in our communities, um, it's hard for us to be all consumed by politics and, and political power. And I think mm. many, many on the on the activist left really don't have those things to to occupy, um, you know, mind share or bandwidth in their head that it's all about politics all the time. And, and parenthetically, I don't think uh, social media has done any of us any favors in that regard, because I think social media creates a platform or platforms to be fully consumed by politics 24-7, um, as opposed to having other interests and occupations that, that may be more productive and worthwhile and, and candidly just healthier. It would seem to me that it's almost like a religion to them. Like they, they're, they're, they're usually they're devoid of religion and this kind of fills that void for them. They're all in, like you said. Well, and that's, and that was the, the reference to Gaia worship in, mm -hmm. in the article that um, I, I'm often amused that the party of, of science, um, you know, who seeks to reify and elevate science can be so anti-rational uh, with respect to, um, you know, putting the environment or putting, you know, fill in the blank, you know, whatever the sort of leftist cause du jour is up on a pedestal and, you know, refusing to accept, you know, critical thinking as it relates to analyzing, okay, does this make sense? Is it logically consistent? Um, you know, if, if I follow this to its rational conclusion, where does this take us? Um, it has, it, it has deep similarities to, to religious uh, fervor and passion and, and is fundamentally an anti-enlightenment, anti-rational um, project. And it's funny that those who, who, who purport to be atheistic, I think, in, in many respects, are, are um, far more, quote unquote, religious in their sensibilities. Well, yeah, in, in the way they assert themselves, it's uh, those who are religious recognize the, uh, <laughs> the application, if you will, of, of their passion in life with intensity to something. We, you know, we put it into, you know, faith, whereas they put it into a faith of something else that they will deny as a religion, basically. But uh, uh, you also mentioned, though, that 
the left is able to rally uh, tens of thousands to the streets in the drop of a hat, while the right commands no such passion or, or obeisance. And um, I, I see that too. It's it's like the slightest tweet, and they have mobilization going on. Whereas with the right, it's um, good luck getting them to sh- show up for anything. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah, and I think there and there, you know, there have been reasons given by by you know many observers as to why that's the case. Part of it goes to what I was saying a moment ago about well, people on the right have other things to do. They have jobs, they have families, they have other commitments. That's part of it. I think part of it is you know that point about. Well, you know, our ideas are, are so obviously superior that it should be mm. self-evident. So we don't need to get out there and rally uh, to support them or to to conversely oppose bad ideas. But I think it's more than that. I just I think I think some of it and and I'm, I'm speculating here, but I think some of it is just in the in the disposition or sensibility of, of right leaning people. I think it goes back to to the point about religious fervor that um, I think understanding classical liberalism and all the tenets associated with it is a rational exercise that requires education and self-discipline and and logical thought and, and critical thinking. It is not a religious passion and it is much harder to rally people in service of an idea than it is in service of a, a a religious objective, if you will. And I didn't express that very well, but I think <laughs> that's I think that's part of the difference is that it's it's a um I think because the you know the the principles that that invigorate the right are, are are logical and rational. Um, it is, as a result, unfortunately, more difficult to rally people to their defense than it is those that may be anti-rational and 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 faith-based. It makes me wonder, though, when I look through you know the, the history of uh, well, you say classical liberalism, and I, I think I just want to clarify for the listeners that that would be modern conservatism. When you That's say correct. That's correct. right, so don't don't take that to mean another form of liberalism. I want to make sure, you know, that they, they understand what you're saying. Uh, the, the principles come from classical liberalism from back before. Um, and that is why it is now conservative now. <laughs> right. That's That's right. The, um, but through the ages that you're right, there was a more logical intellectual aspect to it, but it, it still, it prevailed, like you said, through the ages. So there's like some missing ingredient somewhere. So it's not like it can't do it. It's done it before. So, you know, there, there's that missing piece <laughs> that it didn't have to like mobilize, you know, passions like, like the left did, but the, the, the certainty of it was enough. Well, I think, I think part of the difference goes to what I said at the, at the beginning of the discussion about, about getting fat and lazy. I think, mm. Mm-hmm. I think some of the passion that may have driven the the ultimate success and allowed you know classically liberal principles to prevail was the fact that um, there was self interest at work and that you had you had the merchant class and you had and you had individuals um, seeking the betterment in, in in their own condition and that of their families um, you know effectively creating or putting flesh on the bone of ideas around uh, individual liberty and, and free market economics um, in order to advance their own condition. They saw how the application of those principles in contravention of feudalism and monarchy and, 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 and um, uh, you know, statist approaches to, you know, to economic organization how that those principles in action would make their lives better. And so the the prospect for material improvement was sufficient to get people, you know, out in the streets, if you will, and, and out in their communities to yeah. work for the implementation of, of policies and, and, and approaches that would improve their lives. Now that we have all of those things, it's hard, it's hard to get people to rally uh, for what you already have. And that's, that goes back to the fat and lazy point that, uh, well, we've already got these things. So what am I rallying for? Well, you're rallying, you're, you're, you're um, out there making the case to defend 
what you have uh, rather than to gain something that you don't have. And I think that's what many don't realize is um, that the, the prosperity and blessings that you have are the very things we are saying you need to defend now because it will disappear <laughs> if the uh, animated side of the left gets what they want. We will be back into, well, I'm just going to say feudalism because that's really what it is. <laughs> feudalism with the promise of equality that never comes. That's what you'll get. and everything will disappear and then it, but then you'll have to start the long road to fighting back against it again and it it won't happen in a lifetime well that's right and that, and that's why i made the point a moment ago about i i do think that there are many 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 people of goodwill who are left of center in this country who don't understand that their confreres to their far left you know have a project to to effectively tear down the system that that we have enjoyed and has made this country and Western democracies more generally so successful, and that once those freedoms and once those those pillars of economic, cultural, and social um, development are, are sort of pulled down, that it is a very very long road back to rebuilding them. And and again, it, it goes to why I wrote the piece that you're referring to, which is better to defend what we have now and prevent it from being pulled down than to try to recreate that later, yeah. which is a generational project. You look at the advancement of the human condition through the 17th, 18th, 19th century as, as enlightenment and Renaissance ideals were, were being put into practice. And it was a multi-generational project. These things right. don't happen overnight. And, it, and it, again, it's a, it's a bit of a cliche to say it, but it's, it's much easier and quicker to tear things down than it is to build them up. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. I've had that conversation with quite a few people lately, apparently, about the, who are left of center. They say they're left of center, but they believe that when, when I bring up the activity that's coming from, it's coming from the Democratic Party and it's gaining steam and it's getting bigger, but th in their mind, they're thinking, uh, well, they're not, they don't represent the true Democratic Party. They're, they're the extreme. I don't complain about your extreme. So our extreme is just another version of your extreme, which I disagree with. But it's almost like they're not wanting to admit that there's that grip in that party that's grabbing more and more power and, it doesn't care for the viewpoints that maybe they have as far as, you know, they, they think they're left, but just a little bit. Right. And, yeah. and they believe in compromise and working together and, and all these other things. They themselves don't even see the threat that's coming. They don't. And, and I think it's delusional. And, and again, I, I, I ascribe goodwill um, to people in the center left who think, OK, well, you've got your wing nuts and we've got ours and. And as long as they stay, you know, on that far, far fringe and, and right. don't have access to the levers of power, then yes, they can, they can, you know, gnash their teeth and make noise, but they really won't do any harm. But I, I just don't believe that's true. I mean, I think on the right, yes, we have people on the far, far right who are an embarrassment, but mm -hmm. the, the, the principles that they promote and the policies that they're agitating for do not find their way into polite company on the right no, in the Republican no, Party in the conservative movement, they are, you know, they're, they're an embarrassment and, and they're not taken seriously. Whereas on the left, you know, their counterparts, you know, find their, find their way into the halls of Congress and into the Senate right. and, and promote, you know, bankrupt principles and policies that have, that, you know, have been demonstrated to not work and to actually fly in the face of, of the things that have made our society, what it is, and yet, um, and yet they get a hearing. And uh, all you have to do is look at the, um, you know, the Biden um, Sanders um, policy statement. You know, the the working group that they put together, and and some of the objectives in that, you know, in that statement and in that work. And that's not your father's Democratic Party. This is not the right. party of the working class of 
of labor, of good jobs at good wages and, 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 you know, peace and prosperity. And, you know, a, but with a belief that maybe, you know, the government needs to play a slightly larger role in the economy, in the economy than the Republicans think. This is a, a transformative project that is very different from the Democratic Party of a generation ago. You're right about that. Um, uh, I, initially, my family was Democrat a long time ago, um, based upon ideas from like, you know, Roosevelt and, and the poor and working class and, you know, th- the things you mentioned. But over the years, I'm like, they, <laughs> they don't represent that at all. <laughs> it's gotten worse and worse. And, uh, you know, my values are more represented, of course, with the Republican Party, as, as probably yours are. Um, that doesn't mean I'm absolutely 100% happy with everything they do, but that's anything. I just know that no longer does the Democratic Party represent people like me. <laughs> There's just no way. It's a totally new uh, creature. It's a new creature that's spawning from within. That's uh, And you're right. It, no one's afraid of the far right in this country. You, you don't have senators and, and, and representatives in Congress who are, you know, boldly i'm a white supremacist which is probably their only definition of the far right anyway right uh you don't have that but you can look on the left and you see people who are flat out socialist and and all the all the trappings of that that are tied together all the different merging viewpoints so so to say one to the same thread as the other is absolutely not being honest in my opinion yeah, I, I agree with you. And again, you know, this is another area where I think social media hasn't hasn't really helped any of us. I mean, it does tend to amplify um, extremist voices, and and there are extremist voices on the right, and they get yes. hearing on social media, as do extremist voices on the left. But again, mm-hmm. I think the difference is is that people on the right condone um, that form of of extremism, and people on the on, on the you know on the mainstream right conform that that extremism and they don't allow those principles to find their way into into policies and into mm-hmm. political programs and on the left increasingly you know their extreme is finding their way and and we're, again we're seeing that with uh alexandria ocasio cortez and and mm-hmm. um, you know and other you know other you know stridently leftist um uh, members of the of the, uh, of the official Democratic Party, and these people are not being shamed as extremists right. or as mm-hmm. as as you know far left and out and sort of beyond the pale of of acceptable left of center opinion. They're being lionized and they're being promoted and yeah, celebrated yeah. and celebrated exactly yeah. in, in media and entertainment. And uh, it's 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 a frightening prospect to think that um, you know ideas that are that extreme are, are, are finding a home in one of our two uh, major political parties. Yeah, that is definitely frightening to me. Um, and, uh, well, you've brought this up too. I, I, that's been my theory as well, that this, this didn't just happen yesterday. That this has been a process over a few decades to bring us to where we're at now. Uh, you, you mentioned some, uh, I guess I call them aspects of influence in society where they basically, they just worm into it, take it over. And then use it to start influencing society. You know, we of course you have the big media companies and broadcast companies. You have Hollywood. You have the universities. Uh, well, I'd even say churches. I, I would say that there's even been an active attempt to infiltrate large denominations and push top down these mentalities of the extreme left. Um, the question is, is what we do about? Because you mentioned that there is a bill we can take back ground. How do, how do you see that happening? Yeah, I mean, you know, and this is this is something I have discussed with other uh, other people. I think in the in the intellectual sort of vanguard of, of the right, like, well, you know, how do you how do you get the message out? And is it by you know having a a you know a a greater presence you know in those institutions you were referring to? So, for example, there's an organization, Turning Point, um, who are very active in in going on to college campuses and making sure that the right of center voices are heard and policies are promoted. And, and I think that's commendable. And I think that's, that's an example of what I'm describing in action. But there's another point of view that says, you know, these, um, and, and I'll caricature the point, but there's another point of view that says the media is lost to us. Hollywood is lost to us. The campuses are lost to us. 
we certain uh, certain religious denominations and, and their mainline churches are lost to us, and we need parallel institutions of our own. And and you've seen that in um, in the think tanks, whether you have your left of center think tanks and your right of center think tanks, and you've even seen it to some degree in academia, where you have schools like Hillsdale, you know, that won't take federal money, that are right, you know, right of center, or at least you know promote. Um, you know, the concepts of freedom and liberty and market economics. Um, but I just, I, again, I was mentioning before about the war of ideas being a generational or multi-generational project. I think building parallel institutions takes a very long time. And whether we like it or not, the large, large majority of people are watching Hollywood movies, right. are going to traditional Colleges and universities going to traditional um, churches in religious and participating in traditional religious denominations, and so I think I think the battle really needs to occur within those institutions as opposed to creating parallel institutions. And when I say battle, again, it's it's euphemistic. It's making the case, um, you know, within these these organs of of establishment opinion. That there is there is more than one point of view, um, and it's not just a left of center point of view. There is a right of center position on the issues uh, upon which you're speaking or addressing. So, I mean, I I, I think I think things need to be or I, I, the 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 real point of the piece you're referring to was to say we need to be in the fray within those institutions and not just concede that ground. And and I love and and um, I'll probably get the district wrong, but uh, there's a young woman, Kim Klasik, who's running for Congress in a in a Baltimore district, a uh, mm, young African American yeah. woman, very conservative, right. and and she's out there making the case for conservative principles in an inner city district in Baltimore, Maryland, and we need more of that. The Republicans and I, I, I've been in urban resident for most of my life, including substantially all of my adult life. And, and I've seen the Republican Party and, and conservative groups effectively just concede um, the inner city and urban areas to the left. And I, why? There's no reason why we right. should be conceding that ground. And, and my hat is off to Ms. Klasik and others that are, that are in the fray making the case because there is a case to be made. So why would we be afraid to make it? Absolutely. And it I know a little while back we had Joe Collins on this program uh, who's running against Maxine Waters in her district, mm-hmm. uh, uh, African-American man, naval vet. Yes. Um, and, and he was he he's got a passion and a fire in him that I think more conservatives conservatives need to need to rub off on them because uh, he's he's ready to take her down. And, you know, he wanted to run for president. He's like, I'm running for president. You can't stop me. But, you know, they mailed him down, say, hey, start here first. <laughs> <laughs> but he's come out fighting, ready to go, and he's out. He's out in the streets in the area, and he's from that area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's out there with those people, explaining to them, "Look around you. This is what the Democrats have given you for decades. Is this really what you want?" And that's exactly what we need. You're right. That that's exactly what I'm getting at, and and it can be done. And I I I'll speak to my own experience. I I'm originally from California, but I moved to New York City for to start my career working in financial services in the early 1990s. And, and shortly after uh, moving to New York was when Mayor Giuliani was elected mayor. Yeah. And it, it, this seems like ancient history to some, but it seems like yesterday to me, right. people were saying New York City is too big and too complex and too damaged to be governable. It was described as an ungovernable jurisdiction and 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 by implication the best that people could do was just manage decline right you know and try to keep the lights on and, and you know keep the temperature down and and mayor giuliani god bless him came in and with good policies and and not just good policies but but good execution of those policies yes. really made it you know the most livable urban area in the united states and and it shows that it can be done we have examples of where our ideas work and we need to to be true to that and, and get out there and advocate for them. But but currently, 
uh, and I see a little bit of mobilization, but right now we're stuck in a, um, well, like you said, um, it, it self-evident, our ideas are obviously correct, you know, and, and I ain't arguing against that, but it's not, it's not winning the case, the battle, if you will. Um, but I, I remember years ago hearing the term moral majority, uh, where, you know, most Americans think this way and we're the majority. But they said it as if the majority is not doing anything. And, and nowadays, the term is the silent majority. We have a majority, but it's just silent. I, I mean, I don't know if it's true or not. And the reason why we don't know is because they're silent. <laughs> if there's a majority, we don't know because you're silent. And it, I guess what needs to be broken is the si- if there's a majority, make yourself known. And if you're silent, stop being silent. Th- we're in a war. Well, I think. I think the silence comes from what I was talking about before, meaning wh- whether people are, are left of center, right of center, or dead center, people have lives and jobs and families and other commitments, and, and that is a normal and healthy mm-hmm. expression of, of the human experience. And what they don't necessarily have, even in this age where we're saturated with social and traditional media giving us messages of all kinds, mm-hmm. um, you know, what they don't necessarily have is the bandwidth to be fully engaged in understanding how policy A helps you and policy B hurts you. And if all they are hearing about is policy A because the left is out making the case and delivering their message and they're not hearing about policy B, well, then that that silent majority or moral majority or, or whatever you want to call it either sort of just gives into the message that they're hearing policy a or in many cases they stay home and and certainly in in presidential politics we've seen that um in the presidential elections prior to to the election of our current president you saw a large from a turnout perspective and Mm -hmm. and and, you know a motivation of the base perspective you saw a large number of people who i think were natural Republican voters just stay home because no one was speaking to them and and the messages weren't weren't being weren't getting through because they weren't being made and um, and if, if if you want to to invigorate that that silent majority they have to be spoken to yeah well I, I kind of agree with you there 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 needs to be an overall vision and leadership from the right to take you there and the left has that I believe mm-hmm. whether I like it or not they have it. I don't think the right has it just yet. I think Trump is a uh, Trump is a precursor as irritating as he is to people. Wasn't my first pick either, <laughs> but he's determined to go and get it done and he's been he's delivered more stuff that people that right has promised for years and could never do almost as if they weren't trying. He shows up in 4 years and boom, there it is. And I'm thinking we can do that if we mobilize, if we're determined to make it happen, we can do it. Well, I think that's right. And, 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 you know, it, it, I think a, a long discussion of the president is, is probably beyond, beyond the scope yes. of the podcast. But I, <laughs> I guess what I would say yeah. is he, he is as much a, a messenger or a vessel as he is, um, you know, his own avatar for his own policies. Like I, I, I'm not, I'm not necessarily sold that there is a, a Trumpian or Trumpist philosophy, but I do, right. I do think he is, he's a vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um, and an expression of popular will, um, or a popular will that what was not, as I said a moment ago, was not being addressed or spoken to previously. And, and I think long after the president has departed, uh, from the political arena, I, I think the, the, the things that he is speaking to and, and specifically the, you know, the, the people that he's speaking to, um, you know, will will want to be heard, and and it'll be interesting to see sort of how that evolves from a policy and organizational perspective in the Republican Party. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to close on this question here with you. Um, it, it's kind of related, but uh, I don't I don't know. It's it just stuck out to me because this is this is recent stuff taking place. Uh, you're talking about the uh, corporations embracing the woke ideology, sort of thing, and and. and your primary concern is is uh, financial advisories to to major companies and, and that sort of thing, investment groups. Um, but you, you said something to the effect of you, you never thought you would witness such economic suicide like you're witnessing now. 
What do you mean by that? What I was attempting to to convey in that is that I I understand that corporations at their best are apolitical. They they are right. corporation commerce and business exist to satisfy consumer wants and needs, and that's not a political project. And right. so the the question then arises: Well, then why why are we seeing uh, whether it's Nike or some of the other companies who've been, you know, more sort of vocal about their support uh, for leftist projects. Why are they doing that? And I think some of it comes from the um, from the ideological perspectives of, of of their leadership, whether it's their management or boards. And and I would argue that's that's a misuse of 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 their um, uh, fiduciary position. But I think it's simpler than that in many cases. I don't think companies want to be political. What they want to do is thrive and succeed. That is their purpose. They, they, they exist to generate profit. And when you have, and this goes back to what we were saying before about those who are left of center being better organized and more vocal, and then you amplify that or, or that's exponentialized by social media, you have boycotts and and reputational campaigns against companies that appear not to be right. sympathetic to leftist causes, and effectively you've got companies paying protection money. It's just mm -hmm. like the old the old story of you know the the green grocer in a in, you know in a mob controlled district in in the city. You know this is a really nice business you have here. It'd be a real shame if something happened to it, and you have the small small businessman or business person, you know, paying money to the mob to make sure the mob doesn't come in and bust up the joint. And I think you extrapolate that onto a much larger mm -hmm. scale. And that's yeah, what you're scale. seeing in business. And it's, um, it's unfortunate. But you're comparing that again to economic suicide. How is that so? Well, I think ultimately, um, by, by attempting to, um, to ingratiate one's mm. enterprise with goals that are antithetical to the existence of free enterprise right. uh, eventually the the tax or the pre, or the premium that's paid as part of the uh, protection ra racket becomes too expensive to bear that you know there's the goalposts are I'm mixing analogies here but the goalposts mm -hmm. are continually moved and, yes. and ultimately there's no economic price that can be paid um, that makes any sense. And that's, um, again, it, it goes back to, to the initial point of the article, which is mm -hmm. if commerce won't stand for right. free market principles, then who right. will? Exactly. Exactly. And so it's sort of like uh, feeding the crocodile, hoping to eat you last. <laughs> exactly. Well said. Well said. Yes, sir. Uh, Richard, it's been a pleasure talking to you about this today. Um, look forward to more of your articles coming out. Um, uh, expounding on this, uh, this, uh, this idea, other ideas that you've written about, uh, you're actually a pretty good writer. In fact, you, you said that I'm an editorialist, not an investigative reporter. Does that stop? Does that job still even exist? <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with no. Uh, <laughs> I'd agree with you, <laughs> but you do, you do produce uh, pretty good editorials. It's been Thank a pleasure you. having you brother. And likewise. Thank you very much. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. For this essay segment, I want to talk about stupidity. It's not, you know, exactly what you're thinking, but uh, I want to look at the subject of stupidity for a moment, especially in regards to how conservatives tend to use it and how uh, well, I'm telling on you, it's misapplied. Uh, this interview with Richard Schender has reminded me of an article that uh, I've been working on uh, entitled, Dear Conservative, Liberals Aren't Stupid, You Are by a Conservative. And the, the reason for that title and the, the reason for the premise of what I'm even writing about is this that the typical conservative will look at things that um, the far-left liberals will advocate for, and the usual response is, well, they're stupid. And it's kind of left there. 
There, there's no reason to explain why they're stupid. Um, there's no attempt to counter what they see as stupid. It's just like that's as far as we need to go. If we just declare they're stupid, everyone else is supposed to get it. We win the argument, and everything goes back to normal. That's sort of the mentality of how it's approached. But it's that mentality that I call stupid. If, you, if that's the approach that one uses, that makes you stupid. If you think by just saying, well, they're stupid, and that's all you leave it at that, uh, well, that really makes you stupid, in my opinion. And I believe many conservatives suffer from this um, affliction, if you will. It has nothing really to do with whether one group is stupid or another. It really comes down to understanding people's mindsets. And I fully believe that conservatives have been guilty of not truly understanding the mindset of the left that it's growing into. And the only response that they seem to have is, well, they're just a bunch of idiots. They don't know what they're doing, which is supposed to signal to everybody else, hey, don't listen to them. They're a bunch of idiots. But because that's as far as it goes, it really gains no traction in that. Of course, those who agree with you will nod their head and go, yep, they're a bunch of idiots. But you know what that accomplishes? Nothing. But if that's as far as you go, that really makes you the idiot. As was mentioned in this interview, I brought up that the, the mindset of the left, uh, and when I say left, I don't mean the entire group, but the militant left that is gaining more and more traction and power in the Democratic Party and honestly, it's time for those who consider themselves moderates in the Democratic Party to wake up to the reality that they're kicking you out of your own party, and they'll just take your vote and run with it. But what's happening is they are working on a different mindset than what we work on. What makes us actually stupid is not understanding what they're doing. If we just look at them and say, well, what they're doing is stupid, and just assume everyone else will get it, really puts us at a disadvantage. Because in their mind, they're not really stupid. They're just approaching things from a different paradigm. They have a different mindset. But trust me, in their own little way, they're using their brain to accomplish their goals. Whether we think it's stupid or not is irrelevant. It all comes down to this, how they view politics versus how we view politics politics. In the leftist mind frame, because they have a heavy communist socialist influence that's gaining greater ground within that party, they have adopted that mindset where politics is actually warfare. There, there's no distinction between warfare as we understand it versus the politics we tend to separate them in a conservative mind. We see politics, yeah, it may seem like war, but we don't think of it as war. We think of it as, as a political activity in which a people governs itself. That's not how it's viewed in the mindset of the left. The mindset that they have, and, it, and again, this is growing more and more within the Democratic Party, the mindset that they have is that socialistic, communistic view of politics simply being another theater of war in which to engage and uh, advocate for, well, conquer with their ideology and making their goals come to pass. These are a real politic, Machiavellian, mindsetted people. When they set out to do something, they don't put restrictions on themselves. They think to themselves in their head, and this is what makes them smarter than you, conservative. They, they think in their head, what can I get away with? What's going to get me to where I want to go? How can I clobber my opponent and seize power? Because in their mind, it being a war, once they grab the power, they're not going to be concerned about winning popular votes. They're not going to be worried about winning an election. They're not going to be worried about the rule of law or the Constitution. When they feel they have gained enough power, they then don't care what anybody thinks. 
They believe that once they have that, they can then do whatever they want, and then you will see their gloves come off, and you will see what I mean when I explain to you that to them, politics is just another form of warfare. If you look at the history of leftist causes, uh, such as the socialism and the communism, through the years, you will see this element play out time and time again. There's no sense of fair play to them. There's no sense of following the rules unless they think it gives them an advantage. Usually their idea is to disrupt their opponent in any way possible. And, and this is and using lies or slander or terrorism or destruction. These are not beyond the realms of possibilities. We've seen that to a greater degree this year than we've probably seen in this nation in a very, very long time. And to point out, this is from leftist organizations such as BLM or Antifa. The violence on the streets that we've suffered this year is nothing but a manifestation of how they view politics. You might see it as a bunch of idiots causing riots and destruction. And, well, you admit it, this is what you've said, they're stupid. But see, they're actually following a strategy that's as old as the socialist movement is itself, to disrupt, discredit the government, to make those in authority feel like they are not allowed or capable of enforcing the rule of law, inspiring terror that even if you don't agree with him, at least you'll remain neutral, and that leaves them with an even playing field for themselves, but a huge obstacle for everybody else. There's a reason people use terror. There's a reason why terrorists use terror. Terror. It's not because they dislike terror. They see that there are clear advantages in using it. That's why it's a go to for so many people. The leftists love terrorism. Those on the far left enjoy it. To them, it's a means to reach their goal. And to them, the ends do justify the means. They have a favorite, you know, expression. If you want to make an omelet, you got to break a few eggs. Now, what they mean by that is, is everyone else gets to be the egg and they get to make the omelet. A lot of them don't realize that they're going to be eggs too, but that's down the road for them to discover for themselves. But that's the idea is I'll break as many eggs as it takes and I'll make the omelet in my own vision. That's their mindset. That's their goal. Millions of your stupids from across the country are not going to make them change their mind. But you resting on that as if everyone else will get it will definitely give you no influence, no traction, and no defense against what you are up against. We on the right need to educate ourselves as to why they do what they do, the strategies and tactics they're employing, and actively, actively get in the trenches and derail what they're trying to do and maybe even take the fight back into their arena because they view it as a war. And as was written in the article by Mr. Schender, you may not be interested in war, but the war is interested in you. You might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't view politics as war, and therefore I'm not going to play like it's a war. Well, that's all fine and dandy against an opponent who thinks like you. But these opponents don't think like you. They see it as an actual political warfare, and they don't care about the number of casualties that they're going to cause in this fight. I think there needs to be an awakening on the side of the right. I think there is to some degree, but we need to stop just resting on our laurels, resting on a very successful past of our principles, and realize the threat for what it really is. And don't look at it like they're stupid. They're not stupid. They're sinister. They are determined. They will use any means to get what they want. And therefore, we must be on our guard. You've been listening to Rage of the Age. If you love today's podcast, make sure to leave a review on the media you're listening through. Secure future episodes by heading over to rageoftheage.com and clicking the RSS feed button. Until next time, this has been Rage of the Age.